Welcome to this week's Faith and Friends. It's the middle of November. Next week is Thanksgiving, but this week, guys, do you know what this week is? Big shopping week to get ready for Thanksgiving. <laughs> I didn't buy my Thanksgiving presents yet. Well, maybe that's why we have National Clean Your Refrigerator Day on the 15th, oh, so there is room for all of this. Not stuff. a bad idea. Once a year, you clean your refrigerator. <laughs> there you go. Jennifer also forgot to mention that it's National Operation Christmas Child Shoebox Week, which is very serious and very good. And that's coming up today on Faith and Friends as you'll meet a shoebox recipient, Nadia Konratova, who is living proof of how one simple shoebox filled with God's love and Simple gifts can leave a profound impact on a life and many other lives. Also today, a follow-up to last week's show about the opiate crisis. It's part one and a two-part interview with Russ Thomas, who explains how a tree trimming accident led him to a life of addiction, but how God led him out of that. Also today, our Faith on the Field Spotlight feature is Temple Christian Senior Lexi Bailiff. But first, our scripture. Andy? Thank you, Mark. Matthew 25, 31 through 40, when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from his goats. He will set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the King will say to those on His right hand, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer them and say, Assuredly, I say to you, and as much as you did it to the one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. An organization who stands by the belief that their mission is to reach out and assist the older generation recently opened its doors to a new assisted living and rehab edition. Otterbein Kreidersville is part of the Otterbein Network. Jennifer gives us a tour of this new living space designed to feel like home away from home. And that marked the official opening of the newest assisted living and rehab center available in the Northwest Ohio region. Otterbein Cartersville, already a well-respected senior care option, has now expanded. Whether the need is short-term or permanent, Otterbein Cartersville has open doors and open arms to the community's needs. Otterbein is an organization that has served for 105 years to seek to enhance the quality of life and holistic growth of older persons and we uh, we have found always new and better ways to expand our ministry to reach out to serve more and different needs and and as our society changes uh, we are always um, on the forefront of trying to anticipate um, the needs of, of the older persons both today but in tomorrow in tomorrow as well. That desire to be on the forefront means 24 brand new assisted living suites and 17 short-term rehab units designed around the concept of small housing. Meaning private suites, private bathrooms, two rooms for each resident, as well as an oversized kitchen, dining area, family room for all of the residents to enjoy. On October 28th, the official opening for the newly completed project, that oversized kitchen, dining and family area was packed full of people and celebration board members, employees, members of the community, and residents of the Otterbein Cartersville campus gathered together to celebrate a project that is being billed as an answer to the needs in the community. We brought in architects, we brought in engineers, but more importantly, we asked residents, what exactly do they want? And what do they want to live in the type of apartments that they would have? So it started in 2014, and then we started building at the end of 2015. So it's, it's taken about a year-long process to have this building built. We believe that, that what we're doing is, is serving children of God and helping them to uh, stay in control of their lives and live the lives that God would have them live no matter what type of care and support is needed. There is already proof that this care is needed. Shortly after opening, 12 of the 24 assisted living units were rented. The rehab unit was full with short-term patients who will utilize the brand new therapy room as a means to get them back to their permanent homes sooner. It's a new home away from home, 
whether for a few months or for several years, a long-term ministry organization's desire to continually give back to the community and make the community a better place to live. Well, thank you, Jennifer. It is a wonderfully busy time of the year, particularly right here at TV44, as this is the week for Operation Christmas Child Shoebox Drop-Off. And we'll, we'll let you know the exact times this week coming up in just a moment. But first, we've got some folks from Samaritan's Purse that are here to talk to us about Operation Christmas Child, including David Zimmerman, the Regional Director for Samaritan's Purse, Bonnie Condry, who is the Lima Area Coordinator, and Nadia Karnatova, who was a shoebox recipient many years ago. And Nadia, throughout the years, we have heard tremendous stories about how these simple shoeboxes can impact a life, and you're a living example of that. Tell us about what happened when you received a shoebox some many years ago. Well, I grew up in Ukraine, Kiev, and um, when we lived in Ukraine, my dad was a pastor. He would go and preach the gospel, but um, he could not have any job because people would find out he's Christian. They would not give him a job. So we grew up really poor. And uh, one day my parents told me that we'll, we will not have a Christmas uh, presents. So uh, they took us to church and the church was hanging out uh, Christmas presents to everyone, shoeboxes. And when I received mine, I was so joyful. Yeah, and uh, I remember when I opened my shoebox and there was a Barbie and I was so excited because I never had a toy in my life and especially a new toy. So that was really exciting for me. And I remember when I looked at my mom, how joyful she was because he, this is a woman who had nine children and she never could provide for us. She could never give us new things. And there was days where she would go to sleep and pray to God that God will give her some sort of food to feed her little children next day. So that was a really blessing for me as a child and especially for my parents. And now as a mother yourself, that's a lesson you're teaching to your children as well. Yes, I believe Shoebox Operation Christmas Child has taught me how to be a, a giver. A lot of people don't understand when you give, you teach people how to be a giver. So um, when I, um, last year we packed shoeboxes with my children. It was so exciting with them because they, I took them to the store and they picked up a, lots of toys and we packed shoe boxes. They were so excited. We sat down, we prayed for them and my kids were so excited about them. And I remember my little one said, mommy, I wish I could find out who will receive my shoe box. And I told, I told my little one, I was like, it's okay, Alexander. Whoever will receive, he will experience a love of God. And that was really joyful. So yeah, we do that every year now. This year we went already shopping last week, so it's, it's, it's very, very, it brings us together as a family. And what a great opportunity to teach your kids how to be a giver. The Bible says train your child the way he should go. And this is an amazing opportunity for us parents to teach your child to be a giver. I, I, I would take it. So yeah, we do that with my children. I encourage other children to give also. Bonnie, it's a great opportunity, as Nadia was saying. So if you decide you're going to do this, What's the next step? What do you need to do in order to pack a shoebox? Can it be any shoebox? Is there a specific sh type of shoebox? It can be a shoebox that you have at home. You just wrap the top and the bottom separately in pretty Christmas paper, and then you get to go shopping, and you choose small toys, hygiene items, and uh, school supplies that you would like to put into the box. For example, this is for a girl 10 to 14, and so thinking she has sewing supplies, she has a manicure set, some pens, soap and a washcloth, a crank flashlight because they cannot buy batteries at the nearest store, <laughs> pens and pencils. And then the craze in America right now is coloring scriptures. So this are, these are little scripture cards mm. that she can color as well. And then I have all kinds of school supplies, um, crayons, scissors, pencils, pens, toothbrush, colored pencils, and then I even put in a pair of flip-flops <laughs> yeah. that she can use, and some paper. But um, I also this year decided to put a little message on mm -hmm. the lid. So you are loved, or it might say you are important. And then a special thing to put in is a card and a picture of yourself for sharing the box with them, because they love to see that. And then don't forget, the most important thing that I've put in this box is when I bought the things, I prayed for the things that went in, that God would lead me to what this child would like and then to continually pray for the child who receives the box that they will come to know Christ. What are some things that we shouldn't put in the shoe box? 
Well, we should not put anything in that is war-related, like toy knives or toy guns or figurines. No chocolate or food, no um, perfumes or lotions, and no breakable items because they could get damaged in the boxes. And David, as we were talking about beforehand, the impact these shoe boxes make, obviously they go much further than just Christmas time. There is also the, the gospel message involved as well. What I find so encouraging is not only is the gospel presented at the time the child receives the box, because we want the child to know that this fantastic shoe box that they've received full of gifts directs them to Jesus, who is the greatest gift of all. So they're going to hear the gospel when they receive their shoe box. And then each child receives this uh, in their own language, which is a uh, booklet that tells about the life of Christ and his offer of salvation. But then what I find so exciting is that many children are invited to come back to the church where they received the shoebox to go through a 12-week discipleship lesson right there in the context of the local church and at the graduation where they can invite all of their friends, family, the community. The gospel is presented again in the context of the local church and they receive a full New Testament in their language as the graduation gift. So, as we pack shoe boxes, and as your viewers pack shoe boxes, they can know that there is a discipleship program that follows up the shoe box, which is very powerful because the mission of Operation Christmas Child, as Nadia has so well spoken of her own experience, is to demonstrate God's love in a tangible way to needy children around the world and together with the local church worldwide, share the love of Jesus Christ. Nadia, we'll wrap up with you. What is your message to folks about the importance of Operation Christmas Child? My message is I would like to encourage everybody to just um, kind of step out outside the box and just look out there. There's so many kids who are in need, and I believe that God put you here on earth to be, uh, to be his vessel and to be used by God for, for his other children in all over the world, just to encourage them, to give them hope, to give them love when they have no hope left. I believe that's a huge blessing that you can do that for somebody else, for your other brother in Christ. So I believe that uh, it's a good opportunity and I will encourage everyone to just step out of there and get involved and go love on little ones. You know, and TV44, once again, is one of the drop-off sp spots. You can drop off your boxes Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Tuesday and Thursday of this week, you can drop your boxes off from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. Friday, 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. We'll also have some times on the weekend as well, Saturday from 10 to 1, Sunday from 1 to 5, and a final chance Monday from 10 a.m. to noon. And, and Bonnie, we have seen literally semis, multiple semi-trucks, trailers filled to capacity at this site over the years. Yes, last year the Lima area collected 18,200 shoe boxes and this year our goal with God's help is we're going to have 20,000 shoe boxes <laughs> to reach those children throughout the world with God's message of love. Well, you heard it here. 20,000 shoeboxes is the goal for the TV44 drop-off site. You saw the times earlier. You got a chance to drop those off many times this week. Certainly hope and encourage you will do so. I want to thank our guests, Nadia, Bonnie, and David, for taking time thank to you, discuss you. Operation Christmas Child. And now Andy has a story for us. Temple Christian's Lexi Bailiff at the OIO Prep Profile Spotlight tonight. Not only is she the leader of the FCA at Temple Christian, but last winter she also became just the second Lady Pioneer Bowler to make it the district. And she did it as a junior. Going to districts was really fun. It really helped me to uh, be strong um, and know that like, God can use me through that and that I have a purpose you know, in my sports and athletics and whatever I do to glorify Him. And if I do that, they will uh, bless me in that in return. Bailiff saw tremendous growth on her bowling team last year. We had a foreign exchange student and it was cool to get to minister to her through that and uh, we had new bowlers so they were able to learn more about the sport and get involved and have some fun you know along with that and it was also our first year having coach Jack Hamill and he's been a huge inspiration to me and to many people and really encouraged us not only in our sport but in our faith. We prayed with many of our teams. We got to minister to them through that. We met some really cool people and were able to uh, shine the light in those ways. And I really enjoyed that and learned a lot through those experiences. 
And the senior learned from 48 hours this summer at FCA Leadership Camp. It's definitely shown me more of what it means to be a leader and to rise. I really like the promo that they have for this year and the theme uh, to rise and to be strong and courageous that uh, is shown in a lot of different ways some of you may not realize, like just being able to be an encouragement to others in your school and to go out and do things that may be uncomfortable, like there's uh, courage that's involved in that and sometimes you don't always realize that, so just those everyday acts of spiritual bravery that we can take that may cause some sacrifice or even more discipline but are so worth it in the long run. Bailiff will be outside her comfort zone this winter as the Pioneers don't have enough bowlers for a ladies team this year so she'll compete with the boys during team competition. We didn't have enough to make a girls team so we didn't get to have that again this season but I'll still be able to compete individually as a girl in sectionals and singles which are coming up uh, not this weekend but next. Last week on Faith and Friends, I talked with Marcy Seidel of the Drug Free Action Alliance. And if you saw that broadcast last week, then you heard us talk about the opiate crisis in Ohio, what's causing it, what's growing it, and what the Christian people in our community can do to uh, support those who are in the situations, the families who are dealing with this, and what prevention issues are available. Well, this week, we have a testimony of someone who has many of those answers because he's lived things that he probably never thought he would, but he has seen Jesus' restoration in ways that he probably never imagined could be possible. Russ Thomas, thank you so much for joining us this week on Faith and Friends. Let's just get right into your story. Tell us about what happened to you, oh, just a little over 10 years ago. Yeah, it was uh, March of 2004. My son and I were cutting out a tree at, at our home, and all day long I had been practicing the safe ladder techniques of climbing off the ladder onto the branch and cut off the branch. So that way, if something happened to the ladder, I was still safely up in the tree. I used to be a volunteer firefighter, so I was trained in ladder safety. And I got in a hurry, the very last branch, I stayed on the ladder, cut the branch, and it came down and hit the tree and knocked it out from underneath me. So I ended up going down feet first. Uh, I hit a root that was sticking out of the ground with the outside of my right foot, and I ended up with a compound fracture just above my right ankle. So I had surgery that day and uh, ended up developing a staph infection mm -hmm. and six surgeries over a year and a half period. I was being prescribed 12 Vicodins a day for that period. I was a factory worker at the time, so it wasn't like I was in a culture of addiction. And uh, surgery number seven, they amputated my foot, partial leg, just below the calf. And um, so I was pain free they cut off my legs, so I stopped taking the pills and didn't understand the culture of addiction. Or I know there was a risk of addiction, but it wasn't at the forefront of my mind. And uh, after about three days of quitting the Vicodins, my stomach started to burn. My legs started to spasm into the night where I couldn't sleep. So I was new to amputa amputation, and I thought maybe it was nerve-related. People speak of phantom pains. Mm -hmm. So I took some Vicodin to settle that down and the pain went away and I slept well. And that process just kept playing out over and over again uh, to the point that I finally had to realize that I was a, a, addicted to these pills. But it was quite a while after that before I would admit to it. Wow. So we hear, I think the average person at home when they think of a drug addict, um, the picture in their mind does not come to be uh, a middle-aged factory worker with a family, but that is who you were and uh, yet all of a sudden addiction took a hold of you. Yes, I mean, anyone right now, uh, especially this time of year, if you're out cleaning your gutters right now, you're just one accident away from being an addict. So it, it can affect anyone. Like I said, I was 48 years old and uh, living my life normal. I thought I was cruising into retirement and uh, you know, I basically started a, a rebirth and a second life. <laughs> so everything's changed from what I thought it was gonna be. Did, uh, did things continue to spiral downward or were you able to just discover, hey, I've got this addiction issue and I'm gonna handle it. I'm gonna take care of it. No, I was in denial and um, I, didn't, I didn't want to seek help because I didn't really consider myself an addict because addicts, you know, they're living in the street and I had this vision and this judgmentalism about addiction, about addicts that I judged them and the addicts and homeless folks and I, I kind of considered they're where they are because of their own choices. And I nearly became both. Well, I was an addict, but I nearly became homeless from that situation because I started uh, 
spending money that my wife and I didn't have to spend mm -hmm. to keep the pills coming in because I didn't understand the culture of, of addiction, so I didn't know where to find these pills. So my first defense was to doctor hop. I started doctor hopping. I would go to dentists. I would go to back doctors, anyone I, that I could possibly uh, convince that I had a, a pain from an injury or a, an illness that would prescribe me the pain pills. And over the course of that doctor hopping, it was discovered that I was doing this. You know, they have technology now that they can track these mm -hmm. things and they see patterns of abuse in people and they'll just cut you off. Um, I wasn't willing to admit that I was an addict, so I wasn't willing to accept any help. And for 18 months, I watched my pharmacist fill my bottle every month, so I knew where he kept them. Mm -hmm. They've developed better measures now to lock them up since, since then, but I knew where he kept them. And after uh, five nights of no sleep from withdrawal, which is torture, mm -hmm. the pain from the withdrawal was worse than the amputation by a hundred wow. times. The, the stomach and the spasms were incredible. And so I understand what addicts go through with the withdrawal now and why they do the things they do because I found myself on the fifth night at 2 a.m. Um, about to break into Schwederman's drugstore mm. in Wapak to uh, get the pills to get rid of this pain. At this point, all, all through this time, I was taking the Vicodins to gain something. Now I was looking for them to avoid something. Mm. You spend the first part of your career as an addict chasing things and then you eventually start running from things and that's where the the the, the law breaking comes in and people are trying to get rid of the pain that they feel is why they they break the law or why they steal from families and that's where that's where grace comes in but that night it, when I was about to break into the drugstore that's where I met I met Christ for the first time I mean I'd been to a couple churches as a youth growing up with my folks and uh I knew there was a God, but he was up there making hash marks of my good and my bad. And if my good outweighed my bad, I went to heaven. If my bad outweighed my good, I went to hell. But he was a judgmental God, knew nothing about Christ. And um, I never met him in a church, but I met him before I broke into that drugstore that night. <laughs> so you didn't break into the drugstore. No. Is that correct? No. God stopped correct. you. Right. So did you, did you felt like you heard something? You felt like, uh, what was that point? Here you are. The, the addiction is pulling you in such a direction, yet God is stronger than the addiction. Obviously, you have that proof. Yeah. Um, you know, given messages out at the gathering place at our church, um, I always tell people that um, it's, it's not faith alone. There's, there, I have physical evidence of a living God, and my transformed life is that. What I, the people who know me, what I was before this incident and what I am now, um, there's physical evidence of a living God for that kind of transformation to happen, for that kind of circumcision of the heart. You can't do that in the flesh and have it last 10 years. It's impossible. You would have eventually drifted back to who you were. So I don't believe that it's faith alone. God constantly gives us physical evidence of him through transformed lives. But that night, laying on my sofa, it was complete chaos in my mind complete insanity to the point that I was going to commit a felony in all Glaze County, which would have put me in front of Mr. Pepple, <laughs> I'd still be locked up. So it was total chaos in my mind, but it was this, it was this voice of reason. It wasn't audible. It was just, it was just a thought process that I had, and it didn't tell me not to break into the drugstore. It simply said, this affects more than you. That's all it said. And what that did was made me think about my wife and my children and my grandchildren visiting me in prison. Mm -hmm. And that's what changed my path that night. It wasn't, there wasn't a disciplinary action. It wasn't a big, loud, booming voice amongst all this chaos. It was a soft voice. It was a voice of reason, but it still came through strong enough that it overpowered the chaos. Jennifer finishes her conversation with Russ Thomas next week on Faith and Friends, and they will talk more about the restoration process and local opportunities for people to find hope. Meanwhile, as drug overdose statistics sadly continue to rise, what is available for the families who are trying to heal from the hurt? Well, the Drug Free Action Alliance is offering the GAP Network Summit December 2nd and 3rd at the Doubletree by Hilton, Columbus Worthington. 
Every day, accidental drug overdoses claim eight Ohioans, and those reeling from the loss of a loved one often can't find a place to turn. The Gap Networks provides that place. The upcoming summit will cover providing peer grief support, honoring lost loved ones, community crisis responses, and the impact of drug courts in Ohio. Lodging and travel assistance is available, and scholarships are also available to help defray those costs. Contact Brittany Sandage for more information at 614-540-9985, or you can email her at bsandage at drugfreeactionalliance.org. Registration for the event is now open. You can also contact TV44 if you need assistance getting connected to the event. Well, Nicewanger Performing Arts Center is celebrating 10 years in existence. Congratulations to them on that incredible anniversary. If you have not att yet attended a show during this current season, then now is your chance. Longtime Christian musical sensation Sandy Patty is in the midst of her farewell tour and is making a stop in Van Wert at the Nicewanger Sunday, December 4th. TV44 has two tickets available to give away. All you need to do to be eligible to win is sign up, which is very easy. Now you have three different options. Each one could get you one step closer to winning tickets to the Sandy Patty concert. Here's what you have to do. One, you can go to our website, faithandfriends.wtlw.com, click on contest, fill out the form and hit submit. If you don't like that option, here's another choice. Email your name, address, phone number, and your favorite Bible verse to faithandfriends at wtlw.com. Or if you'd rather not have to touch a computer at all, but you still want to enter, then call us at 419-339-4444. Tell us you want to enter into the Sandy Patty giveaway. That concert again is December the 4th. Deadline to enter for the drawing is November the 28th. Running with a purpose. That's what several hundred folks did last month in Elida for the annual Meals Till Monday 5K and Half Marathon. Runners had the choice of either the shorter race or the 13.1 miles, and they made their mark in the lives of students at Allen East Elementary, Bath, Delphus Jefferson, Elida, Lima, Perry, and Wapakoneta. All the funds raised from the race and the bake sale feed hundreds of students every weekend. We have seven local elementary schools that we partner with and they receive weekend sacks of food. And these are children who otherwise would be dependent upon the school cafeteria for their breakfast or their lunch. And this weekend food gives them enough to get through till Monday. They're very excited. In fact, I just got done speaking with a teacher who was one of our volunteers on the course and she was able to tell me that the kids are very excited to receive the food. And so these volunteers are very excited to pour back into the children and get this opportunity to give back in um, to what they're receiving. Great organization, fun event. Your wife even ran the half marathon, didn't she? She finished the half marathon. It was her first. She'd only been training for eight months, and she's gotten from being a sprinter <laughs> to a half marathon runner. Incredible. That's great. Wonderful, wonderful cause overall. Meals Till Monday doing some great things. Mm -hmm. Well, that is all the time we have for this week's Faith and Friends. Next week, part two of my conversation with Russ Thomas, plus a few surprises that <laughs> might involve food might involve dancing. You'll have to find out. I hope we don't have to dance for the food, but there are no surprises in the Bible, just straightforward truth. We leave you now with one last look at this week's passage. Matthew 25, 31 through 40. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set his sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick and in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Words to consider as you go about your week. Thank you for joining us this week on Faith and Friends. We'll see you next time.